We, we've, over the last two years, developed a very sound principle in talking in these workshops. And what we do, what that principle has suggested, is that up until lunchtime on the last day, we try not to talk about insurance at all. And then we save insurance for the afternoon of the last day. And we do that for a very specific reason. Insurance junkies are a very special type of people. And it's not necessarily something the rest of you want to sit around and watch. So we prefer to sort of, kind of do it as an insurance junkie session on its own. Um, and by the way, for, for the record, I now consider myself an insurance junkie. Okay. <laughs> um, the reason why I am breaking that principle at the moment is because there is one specific issue that has come up over the last couple of months, and we talked about it yesterday, we touched on it a bit yesterday, that is primarily driven by the insurance industry, but has a knock-on effect for everybody else in the room. Has a knock-on effect because of the nature of what the insurers have raised, what the insurance concern is. So again, a little bit of background for everybody who doesn't constantly follow the insurance project. The insurance project was due to be finished sometime quite soon. We still intend finishing it sometime quite soon, but our definition of sometime quite soon keeps changing. A consequence of that is that at one stage we assumed that IFRS 9 and the new insurance standard would be adopted at exactly the same time. And therefore insurance companies would be able to change both the liability side of their balance sheet and the asset side of their balance sheet at the same time. What has happened, though, unfortunately, is because of delays on the insurance project, that's not going to be the case. In all likelihood, the insurance standard will be adopted by insurers in either 2020 or 2021. That means there'll be a two or three year gap between IFRS 9 and IFRS 4. Ordinarily, that wouldn't bother the ISB, because from an ISB perspective, all our standards come out at different times. We very seldom have standards aligned to come out at exactly the same time. The problem with these two, though, is that they are very significant to an insurance company. IFRS 9 changes the entire asset accounting for an insurance company. IFRS 4, phase 2, will change the entire liability accounting for an insurance company. Those are two very big changes. And to have one change on one side, and then a year or two later, the other side, has created some concerns from the insurance industry. So to talk about what those specific concerns are, why are the insurance companies worried? The first part that they're concerned about is right now many insurance companies, and in particular European insurance companies, measure their liability at amortized cost or something very similar to amortized cost. And they measure their assets at amortized cost or something very similar to amortized cost. Under IFRS 9, they would be forced to measure some of those assets at fair value. They then have to decide what they do with the fact that they now have a mismatch. If they do nothing about it, they get volatility because the assets are changing in different ways. The liability is not changing at the same time. I have volatility in the income statement. So the first concern for insurance companies is what they do with that volatility. The second concern is that they could potentially exercise certain options under IFRS 9. So we've mentioned that there are a whole bunch of options under IFRS 9 to get to fair value and etc. They could exercise them in 2018 when IFRS 9 comes live. And then in 2020, when we change from IFRS 9 to IFRS, when the new IFRS 4 comes out, they may have to revisit all of those options. Because essentially the new IFRS 4 requires current accounting on the liability side. So let me take a simple example. There are big insurers just up the road from here, pretty much straight up the road from here, that have significant mortgage portfolios. Currently, they measure those mortgage portfolios under IFRS 30, and IS39 at amortized cost, and they create an impairment. They measure their liabilities at cost. Come IFRS 9, they will be obliged to measure those assets at amortized cost with the new impairment model, and they'd have to introduce the whole new impairment model. In two years' time, when, IFRS, when the new insurance standard comes along, 
they will start measuring their liabilities at current value. That means only from that point they would be allowed to use the fair value option under IFRS 9 and measure their assets at fair value. When they do that though, that brand new impairment model that they just built to comply with IFRS 9 gets thrown away. So the second concern is they might build models that they're only going to use for two years and which they have to throw away after two years. The third consideration for them is what they can do under the existing IFRS 4 is they could change their liability accounting. So they've already got their, under IFRS 9, assets are now at fair value, well, they want their assets at fair value so they can change their liability accounting to fair value because IFRS 4 allows you to do absolutely anything you want. Okay? If they change their liabilities to fair value, they then get to exercise the option on their assets and they can take the mortgages up to fair value. Yay, they've got a happy answer. But that means they have to implement a whole new liability measurement system, which in two years' time, when the new insurance standard comes out, they'll throw away. So these are the concerns that have been raised by the insurance industry. The board has, over the last couple of months, considered these concerns, and we actually think that there's validity in the, the concerns. We think there is an issue here. We believe that the issue probably does make sense, and so we have to do something about it. So what we've proposed or what we're looking at doing about it is three different things. When you transition to the new insurance standard, we make it easier for you to reconsider all of the options you exercised under IFRS 9. So remember what I said when we were talking about IFRS 9? I said this is irrevocable and this is irrevocable and that's irrevocable, meaning I make the choice once in 2018 and later when I change my liabilities, I have no choice. So the first thing the board has said is that if you are an insurance company, okay, when you adopt the new insurance standard, you can revisit all of those elections. You get another go at it. Okay? And that another go simply means that irrevocable doesn't work if you're an insurance company. It's not irrevocable. The second thing we've done is we've introduced something called an overlay approach. What the overlay approach says and sorry, what I should say is this is all proposals. The exposure draft goes out in the next couple of weeks. So as things stand at the moment, these are just proposals and we'll hear what comes back through the exposure draft. The second thing we've said is overlay. What does overlay say? It says that if on adopting IFRS 9 in 2018, the day when I have to apply IFRS 9, okay, as a consequence of that, an insurance company has additional volatility in its income statement because of a mismatch of its assets and liabilities. It is allowed to take that additional volatility out of profit and loss and put it into OCI. So all I've done is I've simply removed the volatility introduced by the mismatch of the dates. Under that scenario, under that approach, the insurance company still has to apply IFRS 9 in full. Okay, so no effect on anybody yet. So let's to apply IFRS 9 in full, but it puts an adjustment through profit and loss. It says debit or credit profit or loss, debit or credit OCI for this difference. Again, a simpler, simple enough answer, but now we start to have an effect on people who are not insurance, on the rest of you guys, because what is an insurance company? How do you define an insurance company? So the ISB for the purposes of the standard has said, an insurance company is a company which issues insurance contracts. Right, that makes sense. Insurance company issues insurance contracts. And the assets for which it can make this adjustment are the assets that relate to those insurance contracts. So I start with the insurance contracts on this side, and then I draw a line between those insurance contracts and the assets, and I say if I have insurance contracts, then on the related contracts, on the related assets, I take the adjustment through OCI. Those of you who are in banking supervision, those of you who are in capital market supervision, will know that not everybody who issues insurance contracts is what we would think of as an insurer. BMW issues insurance contracts. Volkswagen issues insurance contracts. Uh, many, many banks issue insurance contracts. So this approach 
will be relevant for those companies. They will be able to use this approach if they want to. The approach is optional. Okay. Assets measured exactly the same, but we've got this debit or credit adjustment through. Um, we've got this debit or credit adjustment through profit and loss and through uh, OCI. If you're in a banking environment and you know your bank has some insurance contracts, you may need to start getting a feel for what they intend doing in this space. If it's a pure insurer, then it only affects the insurance junkies in the room and it's not really important for the insurance junkies. So, well, it's a different kind of importance, let's say, for the insurance junkies because it's everything you're looking at. The third way we can deal with this is what we've termed the deferral approach. Okay. The deferral approach actually allows an insurance company to defer in its entirety the, um, I, the IFRS 9. So what is an insurance company doing in that circumstance? An insurance company does not apply IFRS 9 at all. Instead, an insurance company applies IS 39. So it continues with the old process. None of the changes we've talked about for the last three hours will affect an insurance company if it chooses to do this. But now, because of that, the definition of an insurance company becomes really important. On the previous one, on the overlay approach, I was simply saying all your assets are measured exactly the same. And here is one very clear, transparent transaction. I've got a debit in profit and loss, I've got a credit in OCI, or the reverse. A user of the financial statements can see that. It's very transparent. It's very obvious. They know precisely what the outcome was under IFRS 9. They know precisely what the outcome is under IS 39. The difficulty is that in order to apply that approach, I have to adopt IFRS 9. So I have to go through the whole process of going through IFRS 9. Because the issue was not only volatility, the overlay approach addresses volatility. But the issue, the concern here, is not only volatility. The concern here is also the fact that I have to adopt IFRS 9 and then re-adopt IFRS 9, etc., etc. I might have to build an impairment system and then throw the impairment system away after two years. I might have to adjust my liability accounting and then throw away my liability accounting after two years. Because of all those factors, the overlay approach will help some insurers, but still creates a concern for many insurers. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail to just talk about the deferral approach and how it works. Okay, so, for the sake of understanding the way the board thought about it, in thinking about the deferral approach, we sort of imagined a company that was a conglomerate. And the company has a holding company, it has an insurance subsidiary, and it has a banking subsidiary. In imagining that particular scenario, and that's not an unusual scenario that you have banks and insurance in the same companies. In fact, most of the big insurers in Europe seem to have at least an association with a bank, very often have some kind of banking activity. Now, you don't always think of it as a bank, but very often the activity is very similar to a banking activity. So we think that's a very common structure, but even if this is not a common structure, maybe what I've got here is insurance activities, and what I've got over here is an investment manager. An investment manager is also not an insurance company. It simply manages assets on behalf of somebody. So you have this problem coming into play in this space as well. So what we looked at is we said there are two ways we can think about this. The first way is to look at it at what we call the legal entity level. So what I do is I say within the single legal entity, the insurance company applies IS39 and the banking company or the other company applies um, IFRS 9. So what I do is I have a mixture of the two things in here. Okay, it's great. What it does is it targets the specific area where I have a problem. So if I'm thinking about a company like Allianz, which has both insurance and bank, its bank would be under IFRS 9 its insurance would be under IS39. It's effectively using two standards in preparing its accounts. Okay. If I think about companies like Volkswagen, what Volkswagen would do, it would ring fence its insurance activities and account for those under 39. And all the rest of its activities, everything else it does, would be accounted for under IFRS 9. So I've got that method and I can think about it that way. 
It seems like an easy solution on the face of it. Um, the first clue to the problems, though, sits over here. Because my holding company is not an insurance company, and it's not a bank, but it's got some insurance activities and some bank activities. So how do I account for that mixture of activities at the top level? But there are other concerns. How do I deal with transfers? What happens when my bank sells something to my insurance company, or my insurance company sells something to my bank? In that situation, what I'm going to have is I'm going to have something that's accounted for under IFRS 9, transferring into an environment where it's now accounted for under IS 39. There's a potential, as we've just heard, for different accounting methods. If, so, two different ways I can think about it, and just, just as, a, as a thought for a moment. If I had this accounting, and I had a bank and insurance company, and I had the problem you were talking about a few minutes ago, where I'm suddenly going to have to apply the SPPI test and fail the SPPNI test, then all I have to do is I have to put all of those assets into my insurance company, and I apply IS39. Okay. And I put all the assets where I like the accounting under IFRS9 into my bank, and I apply the bank accounting. So it creates those sorts of concerns, and as I say, when I transfer the assets back and forth, I've then got to think about one of two approaches, in fact, one of three approaches. The first approach, is that the accounting always follows the asset. So I buy an asset in my insurance company, I sell it, and so I account for it under IS39, I then sell it to my bank, and in my bank I continue to account for it under IS39. So I haven't changed my accounting, the accounting stays exactly the same. Great answer. Except under that circumstance, this is very quickly going to become a color, a sort of a shade of green and blue. And this one's going to be a shade of green and blue. Because some of the assets in here would have been originated in the bank and they keep IFRS 9. Some of the assets there would have been originated in the insurance company and they keep IS39. So that sounds like a real mess. That sounds like a really, really messy answer. So the next way I can deal with transfers is I can say, okay, instead of doing it that way, what I will do instead is at the point that I sell an asset from the bank to the insurance company, the accounting for that asset changes. So the accounting starts um, as IFRS 9, it changes to IS 39. Or it starts as IS 39 and it changes to IFRS 9. But if I do that, when I transfer an asset internally, when I move an asset from my left-hand pocket to my right-hand pocket, the accounting will change and a profit or loss will jump out. I'll get a different measurement, which means a different profit or loss, and then I've got to decide what do I do with that profit or loss. So I can do two things. I can recognize the profit or loss in my income statement, but now I've broken one of the really big principles of accounting, which is all that's happened is the asset has moved internally from one place to the other, and yet somehow I'm showing a profit or loss as though some external event had happened. So that's one way I can do it. The other way I can do it is I can say, okay, I've got to tag each one of those assets and liabilities, and I've got to follow that asset and liability through its life. So what I will do is I will change the counting from IS39 to IFRS9, then I will take that profit or that loss that came about, and I will track that profit and loss on an ongoing basis until I eventually sell the asset, and then I'll only recognize the profit or loss. So I get a mixture of IS39 and IFRS9 type of accounting. My balance sheet reflects wherever the entity is. My income statement reflects where the entity was. I only recognize the profit when the eventual sale happens, when the eventual recognition happens. Okay. So just thinking about this, you can see that these options potentially, for those of you then who are charged with bank supervision, you're sitting in this green block, if we go down this approach, you're going to have one or two things happen. You're either going to have assets floating around in your bank that are measured under IS39, or you're going to have your bank suddenly making profits or losses on internal transactions, or you're going to have some profits or losses that are delayed and then eventually pop out at some time in the future for no particularly good reason. So that's one option that we've looked at to help the insurance companies.
The advantage of this approach directly addresses volatility. Okay, so it helps with volatility. The volatility is sorted. There's no issue there. It directly addresses the cost related to double application because the insurance company will not have to apply IFRS 9 twice, once in 2018, once in 2020. And it directly addresses the lack of readiness of some preparers because some insurers have been sitting on their hands and are suddenly realizing that it's going to be very difficult to implement IFRS 9 now. The disadvantages are this thing of mixed balance sheets that we don't actually know what's on the balance sheet. Is it IFRS 9? Is it IS39? Where is it? And et cetera. You're also going to have some insurers that decide to adopt IFRS 9 and some insurers that choose to adopt IS30, keep with IS39. So even insurance companies are not going to be directly comparable. There's no direct transparency. The advantage with the overlay approach was we saw what the IFRS 9 number was and we saw a single adjustment between IFRS 9 and IS39. Here we don't see that, so we've got to fix it some other way. We need to help people with disclosure some other way. And then the last problem here is no matter what we do, whenever there's a transfer between the bank and the insurance company, you create some confusion. Either you create profits or losses, or you create a mixed balance sheet, a mixed, mixed balance sheet, um, or you create these hanging debits, this unrealized profit or unrealized loss that kind of hangs around. So that's one approach. The approach that the board has decided on, though, is the approach that we're talking about here, the reporting entity approach. What does reporting entity approach mean? It means that the entire group of companies either adopts IFRS 9 in its entirety or stays with IS 39 in its entirety. Okay. So you one or the other. And the way that we test for that is in order to stick with IS 39, you need to be a company that is predominantly insurance. So most of your business is insurance. That means VW fails. Volkswagen won't make the test because Volkswagen is obviously not predominantly an insurance company. Many other companies are going to fail because they are 50% banking, 50% insurance. Okay. But those insurance companies that have banking activities and are predominantly insurance will pass the test. Now, I don't like mentioning names, but I suspect a company like Allianz would pass the test. What does that mean? It means that if you are now regulating the bank, your point of regulation is over here. What you are going to see is IS39 accounting until 2020 or 2021 if you exercise this option. Okay. It means that the benefits, the impairments, the business model test, the SPPNI test, et cetera, et cetera, will not kick in for banks that you regulate that are under the old model. Oh, sorry, that are held by insurance companies or that are predominantly insurance. The reverse side of that, it means that if you are... Uh, well, there's not a, not a reverse side to it. So what you're going to have in all likelihood in the jurisdictions you're in is you're going to have some banks, the banks that are subsidiaries of insurance companies reporting under 39, you're going to have some banks, the banks that are not subsidiaries of insurance companies, reporting under IFRS 9. You're going to have all of the capital market companies likely reporting under IFRS 9. So everybody else, the non-FI guys, will report under IFRS 9. Okay. The reason why it's important then for the bank regulators is it suggests that whatever your IFRS 9 plans are, they may have to accommodate the fact that some banks in your area are still reporting under IS39. Okay. You do have a tool in your arsenal from a regulator perspective, and that is that from an IFRS 9 perspective, this is an option. Okay. Because it's an option from an IFRS 9 perspective, it is entirely acceptable for a regulator to say, you, Mr. Insurer, may not use the option. You can stop them using the option. However, I would suggest that you're going to find that quite hard to do. Any questions? Sure. 
And I think, I think it's a very valid concern. So the question there is why would we essentially exclude one industry? What makes insurance special enough? It's essentially entity-specific IFRS. Okay, so why would we consider doing entity-specific IFRS? And does that mean there's a flaw with IFRS 9? I think the, 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 the answer there is firstly, do I find it a flaw? Absolutely. Personally, would I want to do this? Not if I could help it. We have tried to, from a board perspective, really try every possible option to avoid getting to this space. The difficulty we've got, though, is the flaw is not IFRS 9. And by the way, we're spelling flaw now, F-L-A-W. The flaw is not IFRS 9. The flaw is the delay in producing IFRS 4, producing the new insurance standard. So what we have done is we have created a problem by having two very significant standards that both affect one type of company, an insurance company, and not actually aligning the date of adoption of those two standards. Something we've done, something we've got to take responsibility for, the reality is it's taken us longer than it should have to finalize the standard. And by the way, for anybody who, again, not insurance junkie, but for anybody who is not an insurance junkie, who would like to know how long it has taken us to complete this standard, okay, we started working on the insurance standard in 1997. Okay. <laughs> so there's, there's some people now, there are interns working on the project who weren't born when we started. It's, and there, there are people who started working, there's one particular gentleman who started working when he was 38 on the project. The effective date will be 2020. He will be retired when we eventually adopt the standard. <laughs> but yeah, look, I think, I think this is not a good answer. It's not an answer I'm excited about. It's not an answer I'm proud of. The problem with this is it was created by something the board did in taking too long to finish the insurance standard. And what we've got to accept then in thinking about this is, is the problem that we have created with the misalignment of these dates so unique that we have to find a way to fix it? And the conclusion the board has come to is, yes, we do. It is so unique, we think we have to try and fix it. Oh, no, 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 okay. So, so, so perhaps, yeah, sorry, I, I misunderstood then. So, essentially going forward, from 2020 or 2021, Insurers will apply IFRS 9 to all of their financial instrument assets and to all of their financial instrument liabilities. They'll apply IFRS 9 in full from that date. But what they will do is they will apply the new IFRS 4, the new insurance standard, to their insurance contracts, just to their insurance contracts. So IFRS 4, the new accounting standard, only applies to their insurance contract liabilities. And the argument that we've got for insurance contract liabilities is insurance contract liabilities are essentially a financial instrument, but they are a very, very unique type of financial instrument. The accounting that we've got for those financial instruments is one is an accounting that says that they must be accounted for at full fair value, full current value essentially. And what we do is we then provide a tool for how you determine that fair value. And arguably, Somebody, the lady asked me here about IS-19. I think the long-term solution to pension liabilities is pension liabilities are just like insurance liabilities. And I think the long-term answer to your mortgage problem is it's very much like an insurance liability just on the asset side of the balance sheet. What it's got is a few known cash flows and a lot of unknown cash flows and a heck of a long duration. You don't know how a, a mortgage bond has got a very long duration, a contract liability has got a very, uh, insurance contract liability is a very long duration. When, when, we, when we pull out 
insurance contracts from FI. It's because we're trying to account very specifically for the very long duration, 40, 50, 60 years. In fact, I've seen now some are 80, 90 years duration. Um, the, and what you're having to do in a fair value world is you're having to predict or, ta or derive an insurance, uh, sorry, an interest rate curve for 90 years. So we need to help with that process. And the uncertainty, the risks that are inherent in an insurance contract, that uncertainty. And we may well learn lessons out of that that we apply back to financial assets eventually. And I, I think that's right. I, I, I think, I mean, I, when we started out on the insurance project, a lot of the discussion around insurance was exactly the point you're making. What makes insurance special? And one of the conclusions we came to is the lack of availability of a traded market means that fair value can't be derived from the market. It has to be determined through a model. But right now, the insurance models that have been applied to get to fair value are vastly different. And so what we needed to do was provide application guidance to help you determine what, and the way we determine it is the current fulfillment cost is of a liability. How much am I most likely to pay out discounted back to today? So you can think of it to a certain extent as application guidance in order to determine the current value. And it's consistent then in many ways with the FI approach.